as we invite the President of the Republic of Kenya, Dr. William Samoe Ruto. Mr. President. Thank you very much, and let's take our seats. Thank you very much, Asante Sana. Um, Mr. Deputy President, the Honorable Chief Justice and President of the Supreme Court, Lady Justice Madakome, the Speaker of the National Assembly, Moses Wetangula, the Deputy Chief Justice, the Attorney General, Judicial Officers, fellow leaders, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, it's my first occasion to be in the judiciary in uh, my new role. I've been here before. And uh, I want to thank the Chief Justice for putting a passionate case for the judiciary. I have listened to all the speakers very carefully, especially the Chief Justice, on what kind of judiciary we must look forward to. You have made a very passionate case on matters, human resource, technology, resources, and when I stood to walk out, I went to check on the toilets and abolition blocks, the one you said, <laughs> they have been set up outside the premise. And uh, I confirm that indeed we need to do something about our judiciary especially those of us who are in the other arms of government. It is true, uh, the governor of Nairobi has been on phone with me and the Chief Justice on some of the teething problems that we can sort out just by opening free conversation and consultation between the various arms of government and I want to thank the Chief Justice for being facilitative of the work of the executive. And in equal measure, we will be facilitative of the judiciary because in the end, we want to serve the people of Kenya together. Um, it is correct for the governor of Nairobi to work with us, and I have already given firm instructions on digitizing Nairobi and many of the big towns and making sure that we have digital cameras so that we can make it that much more easy for us to move traffic and traffic cases that constitute a huge percentage of the backlog in our courts should be done in the space that provide for instant fines online so that we can decongest our courts. I agree with you, Governor, and uh, we will work with you in making sure that that happens. I, however, am not too sure about the concept of sharing fines with those who report, maybe you will need a small note from the Attorney General uh, by way of uh, a legal opinion. But it is with great honor to join you today as you launch the State of the Judiciary Report. The judiciary is a vital component of the Kenyan state and an arm of government which serves as an independent and serves an independent role in the life of our nation with a core mandate of dispensing justice to all, fostering adherence to the rule of law, and respect to human rights and continuous improvement 
of our good governance. The state of the judiciary, its capacity, performance, achievements, impact and prospects matter a great deal to all of us. Our commitments, insofar as they relate to the judicial arm of government, are important. We all have a duty to observe the rule of law and to respect the authority of our judicial institution and its officers as a cardinal ingredient of our mandatory commitment in Article 3.1 of the Constitution. The state of the judiciary matters because the government's mandate to ensure stability, enforce law and order, resolve disputes, maintain security, guarantee safety, and promote well-being directly relies on the existence of an effective and efficient legal system. The workings of our judicial system demonstrates the extent to which individual welfare, economic efficiency, state capacity and fundamental rights are intertwined. If you care about the economy or national security or constitutional rights or how individual citizens fare, you must care about the state of our judiciary. At the inauguration of our administration, I stated our commitment to do our part in consolidating the role of the judiciary in our constitutional and democratic order and in cementing Kenya's place as a country guided by democratic ideals and the rule of law. I noted the importance of implementing the judiciary fund to secure the financial autonomy of the judiciary, thus securing its operational independence. We also commit to enhance the budgetary allocation to the judiciary annually to support the bottom-up delivery of justice by increasing the number of small claims courts, establishing high court stations in the remaining seven counties, setting up magistrates' courts in 123 sub-counties, and supporting the judiciary's digitization program, which we were, was displayed to us this morning, and it is doing a great job. The intended objective of these interventions is the expeditious adjudication of cases and the expansion of access to justice. It is important to know that these interventions will be complemented by other measures across the entire spectrum of the judicial chain, including the enhancement of autonomy and professionalism of our police service. It is worth expounding on the broader context behind these, exp uh, these ex interventions. Our administration was elected on a platform to pursue certain interlocking agendas. Primarily, the bottom-up approach is in pursuit of socio-economic transformation to achieve shared prosperity where no one is left behind. To do this, we recognize the cardinal objective of citizen well-being at the front and center of our immediate, medium-term, and long-term policy programs and projects. This being the case, it is inevitable that our program of action aligns with the implementation of measures that are necessary to attain socioeconomic rights set out in Article 43 of the Constitution. We see the nation to be greater than the sum of its individual citizens. Its stature and might, therefore, consist of the aggregate happiness of the people which constitute it. We conceive this nation's prosperity to consist of the achievement of well-being citizen by citizen. 
well-being considerably depends on the existence of meaningful opportunities for citizens to realize their aspirations. It is our manifest commitment to facilitate access to these opportunities by ordinary uh, citizens on a rapidly increasing scale. We intend to begin with deliberate programs to create millions of jobs in agriculture, manufacturing, housing, and within the micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises level. These are the two limbs of our bottom-up model of economic transformation, scaling up from the individual to the nation and from the little hassles to the commanding heights of our economic system. The duty of government to its citizens is to open doors of opportunity on one hand and to protect freedoms and rights on the other. Opportunity lies in vibrant, diverse, competitive and dynamic economy whose efficiency is guaranteed by a credible system of enforcing contracts and securing property rights. However, whichever way one approaches the matter, a robust, independent, and effective judiciary, which inspires the confidence of all citizens, lies at the heart of national socioeconomic transformation. This is why the state of the judiciary matters to everyone in Kenya. It is encouraging to note the extent of alignment between the executive and the judiciary as reflected in the state of the judiciary report. I say this in full awareness of the dictates of separation of powers and the unique constitutional autonomy of the judiciary in the triangular relationship among the traditional arms of government. Nevertheless, from our distinct and separate domains, we can use the Constitution as our compass to navigate our way through our respective functions to attain the highest standards of living for all Kenyans. This is precisely what is captured in the Kenya Panza Plan, and that is the bottom-up transformation agenda on one hand, and the strategic vision of the judiciary on the other and that is social transformation through access to justice. Both documents explicitly set out the realization of the promise of the Constitution of Kenya 2010. They championed the inclusion of the traditionally excluded and historically marginalized sectors of our society. Each document also prioritizes the millions at the bottom of the socio-economic and political pyramid as the foundation of sustainable transformation. Furthermore, we are united in the knowledge that an accessible, efficient, and impartial judicial system facilitates shared economic development that meaningfully includes the needy, most vulnerable, and marginalized segments of our society. We also recognize that the efficiency of the judicial system in the resolution of commercial disputes and securing property rights is key to making Kenya a destination of choice for investors. The government, therefore, will support the judiciary to attain efficiency in its operations so that it can effectively contribute to the attraction and retention of foreign and domestic investments. The judiciary's stated aim to tackle systemic formal as well as informal barriers to access to justice resonates quite strongly with our administration's objective to provide access to public uh, platforms and processes for previously excluded or underserved groups. I am satisfied that this model of delivering justice from the bottom up underpins citizen well-being and complements it with the opportunities for self-actualization created by stronger economic performance and higher investment confidence. The socio-economic transformation through access
access to justice is a program that is responsive to the gaps in the judicial system, ensuring that possibilities become a reality by virtue of decisive measures to develop a highly a high quality, accessible, efficient, expeditious, and cost effective judiciary. Such a people centered approach aligns admirably with our broader transformation agenda. I have noted from the state of the judiciary report that the judiciary has made progress in delivering value for taxpayers' investments in establishing critical infrastructure and achieving significant improvement in resolving disputes. For example, the small claims courts cohort of the, judi of the judicature now comprising 11 courts, disposed of 9,315 cases, unlocking 1.4 billion that had been held up in disputes. The first specialized sexual and gender-based violence court was inaugurated in Chanzu in Mombasa, and the political party's disputes tribunal was decentralized to seven regions. It is highly commendable that part, apart from setting up premises for high court, land and environment court, and magistrates courts across the country, the judiciary has also complemented these developments with ICT capabilities. Various judicial procedures have been simplified and disseminated to standardize service delivery. The case tracking system has gone a long way in reducing the burden of manual performance of various important judicial tasks. Collaboration with technology companies, particularly Google Africa, has enhanced internet connectivity to support virtual court proceedings across the country. From the slow, manual, cumbersome, and vulnerable judiciary of recent years, we are now witnessing the rapid evolution of a judicial system that is smart, connected, digitized, automated, and efficient. Steadily, the judiciary is getting ready for the challenges that lie ahead and shaping up as a fit for purpose vehicle for delivery of justice. It is no surprise then that the number of cases filed or pending as compared to those concluded on an annual basis provide an encouraging report. The judiciary now has better capacity to measure its own performance and capture all aspects of service delivery in accurate statistics. Cases are being concluded faster and the number of matters stayed in the courts is declining. The decline in overall backlog rate, despite the rise in numbers of new cases, points to enhanced efficiency. This is also encouraging. A direct effect of this performance enhancement is, the, is that judicial officers have been liberated from the tedious, inefficient, and manual labor freeing them to perform their core function, and that is the production of robust jurisprudence that breathes life into our constitutional and legal dispensation. The state of the judiciary report also include numerous instances of jurisprudence that involve the invalidation of executive measures. All I can say is that we will strive to live up to our commitment to work within the Constitution and avoid running a fall with our courts. As I give this assurance, I am alive to the fact that the judiciary has mechanisms to achieve accountability for the exercise of judicial power and for public resources entrusted to it. 
of the Judicial Ombudsman are tremendously enlightening, particularly noteworthy, is that beyond resolving complaints, the mechanisms investigates root causes to minimize recurrence. And I want to encourage uh, Madam Chief Justice and the judicial uh, system to improve on the judicial ombudsman's performance. The public and the other arms of government expect the judiciary to perform its duty with integrity. And it's my expectation because judicial power and independence comes with huge responsibility. And huge responsibility comes with a good measure of accountability. And that is why to be able to exercise judicial power and independence effectively, responsibility and accountability must come with it. And I want to work with the judiciary to support the judiciary so that we can have an accountable and responsive judicial system. Integrity assurance and corruption prevention are essential pillars of remedial and corrective action. Likewise, the judiciary's performance management enhances staff accountability and guarantees service delivery to a high professional standard with assurance of continued improvement. Enforcement of Judicial Service Commission's Code of Conduct also forms part of the performance management and integrity assurance framework. And together, they provide the basis for internal audits that are used to measure and improve performance in the judiciary. I have noted all these impressive achievements for two principal reasons. First, the high standard and consistent improvement was achieved in spite of the judiciary's staff establishment falling far below its requirement. Currently, the judiciary has 6,182 employees. To operate optimally, the report states that the judiciary requires 9,417 employees, 348 judges, 1,200 judicial officers, and 650 law clerks and legal researchers, and 7,219 judicial staff. Secondly, the impressive performance was achieved on a budgetary allocation which stood at 0.6% of the national budget. Without a doubt, the low budgetary allocation has affected critical projects and activities. It is with this in mind that I gave the undertaking, and which I repeat, to enhance annual allocation to the judiciary for the next five years in an effort to mitigate the opportunity cost of accrued shortfalls. And since we have the other arms of government represented here, we have committed to increase the budgetary allocation to the judiciary by three billion shillings every year to make sure that we build the necessary infrastructure, hire the requisite numbers of staff, and build ICT capabilities to enable our judiciary deliver on its mandate. I congratulate the Chief Justice and the entire judicial service for doing a good job against serious constraints. We do not take for granted your admirable effort to raise the standard of output amid such tremendous challenges. I believe that I have demonstrated sufficient commitment to provide confidence that we in the executive shall do our part to support the judiciary in delivery of its mandate. I applaud the judiciary's overall performance 
and its consistency in retaining public trust. We acknowledge that there are gaps, of course, but we also recognize that there is demonstrable opportunity, capacity, and commitment to bridge them to the satisfaction of all citizens. I pledge our support to your vision of social transformation through access to justice because it is our duty to do so, because we are aligned in our transformational agenda, and because we share a citizen-centric bottom-up delivery model focused on individual and collective well-being of all the citizens of Kenya. For the avoidance of doubt, I reiterate my commitment and that of the government of Kenya to live up to our pledge to the people of Kenya that we intend to empower the judiciary and the criminal justice system as required by the Constitution as well as respect the decisions and orders of the courts as they relate to the executive. Expect no more or no less. And even as we commit to the independence of the judiciary and to support the judiciary, give it financial independence. We do the same for all the other independent institutions. I did commit that we will do the same for our police service because we believe that a professional police service will do the job. I have already established an independent um, budget and appointed an independent accounting officer for the police service so that they can discharge their mandate without reference to any other office or any other institution as is required of us by law. I am a great believer and I will work with all the arms of government in building our institutions and respecting those institutions. We will build the judiciary and respect the judiciary. We will build all the other institutions, including the police and other institutions, uh, and, and support them and respect them. We cannot, at the same time, be bringing down our institutions and expecting them to work for us. We must collectively, as a, as a country, work towards building all the institutions set up by the Constitution as a guarantee for the country being built on the solid foundation of the rule of law and respect for the Constitution. Any other attempt to build this nation on the basis of individuals and personalities will lead to monumental failure. As we build, and I, I want to commit that we will support our security agencies to take up their mandate and protect and safeguard the sovereignty and the security of our country. And we will work with them to eliminate groups and sections that work against the Constitution and the law. I am very clear in my mind that we do not need the advice from the Scotland Yard to be able to remove and disband the murderers units in our police force. We didn't need any advice from nowhere. We just needed to respect our constitution and do the right thing. I am very clear in my mind that supporting a professional police force will guarantee the lives of every Kenyan and the security of our property and we will get rid of the menace of extrajudicial killings. We certainly don't need the support of
institutions built by others, we can build our own institutions. Even those other institutions that we celebrate, be they the Scotland Yard or the FBI, they were built by countries who respect the rule of law and who believe in institutions. We should believe in ours. We should support our police force. We should support the independent police oversight authority. We should build our institutions. They will guarantee our security and they will guarantee our democracy. And that is what I believe in. Let me also say, uh, for the record, because I hear our friends and brothers from the opposition uh, trying to propose to us that we should denigrate our own institutions and work with the institutions of others, that we are much more sure of building our own institutions. And secondly, let me also say, for the avoidance of doubt, that as we commit additional resources and financial independence of all our independent institutions, the judiciary, the police, and all the other institutions, we must all work collectively towards making sure that we have savings and we collect revenues that will support our development. I want to ask the judiciary to work with us and not to provide any safe haven for the people running away from paying tax. They should not find refuge in the judiciary. They should not find refuge in judicial orders. We want every citizen to carry their portion of the burden of running the affairs of our country. That is the request I am making uh, to the judiciary as I do to the legislature, that we must all work towards sealing the loopholes of pilferage and leakage in our uh, revenue collection. I think it is important for us to note that as a percentage of GDP, we are collecting 14% of our GDP. Our neighbors are collecting 25% of our GDP. So we are lacking behind. And that is why we have shortage of resources to run our development program. Our friends in the opposition are telling us that we should continue to borrow and we should not raise our, revenue, our, our savings. I want to say, for the avoidance of doubt and on record, that already we have had conversations with the Central Organization of Trade Unions, we have consultations with the Federation of Kenya Employers, and we have all agreed, except the people in the opposition, that it is necessary to increase our contributions on savings from 200 shillings to 6% of our salaries. Our brothers and sisters in the opposition should wake up to this reality and smell the coffee. Kenyans are moving on. We want to raise our savings because at the moment we are between 10 and 12 percent of GDP in terms of savings. We can scale that up to between 30 and 40 percent of our GDP. That is the surest foundation of running our development program, not merely thinking that you can go on a borrowing spree. In any case, the money you go to borrow is the savings of others, and you have to pay through the nose if you have to borrow. So we have, everybody's uh, job has been cut out, and uh, uh, we will continue to have this conversation because we are a democratic nation. Finally, and once again, I congratulate the judiciary on the commendable progress made in delivering your solemn constitutional mandate and wish all of you God's blessings as you proceed on the journey to transformational success. Thank you and may God bless you.
Asanteni sana. Ladies and gentlemen, may we all be upstanding for the national anthem and the lowering of the mace. National anthem. Thank you. We are all welcome for lunch. 